All right, I am back. Yeah, okay, so I'm just gonna take like, a, I'm just gonna wind down just for a few minutes, uh, and just catch up with people and, and not be uh, so focused on the stream. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go back into coding. I also need a quick drink. Uh, someone's asking, is there going to be support for int float type, type, suffixes, type suffixes like 10L, 10.0F, uh, etc.? So the way we're going, for now, I'm just using, I'm just pretending that the internal representation of all, uh, of integer literals is a UN64 and of floats is a double. The way it's going to work uh, once we do a more real pass on that stuff is it's basically going to work like Go and to an extent Haskell where uh, integer literals are actually untyped and they're essentially, they're not quite, I mean, in Go, they're not arbitrary precision. I think Go requires at least 20 to 256-bit precision. Um, but basically what it'll mean is when you're doing constant expressions, you don't really have to worry about it. And that's really useful when you have explicit typing or explicit, explicit conversions between different size integer types, because it means you don't need to worry about stuff like type suffixes or converting, uh, converting, uh, literals from from one type to another and so um, that's that's how i plan to handle that eventually but for now everything is implicitly a un64 but we'll revisit that It's garbage. Okay, let's fix the bug that someone mentioned with uh, with scan int. So if it's just a plain zero, um, It's the easiest way to handle. I guess I could just. Be nice if I could just use this case below. Okay, let's try that just to make sure the existing crap works. Uh, someone's asking about hex float literals. Not super interested, maybe. Uh, we can certainly, it's easy to add later, so. Uh, but yeah, easy, easy enough to add, for sure. I mean, it's a convenient feature for some system stuff, and also for serialization. But yeah, all right. Um, Is 
the main case where I feel like, so, so this may be just lim my limited exposure. The main case where I've seen stuff like hexploit literals have serious value is, and it's a case where I'm not even sure about the basic premise, but, um, you know, like text-based uh, formats for, for float vertex buffers and stuff like that, uh, rather than relying on uh, more error-prone parsing. I mean, there's ways to do correctly rounded parsing uh, of floats, of course, uh, of decimal floats, but uh, hex floats are kind of foolproof, and so in, in a in a different way. And so uh, I've I've seen people use it for that, both because it's faster to parse, and also if you're writing a simple parser in your own engine or whatever importer, uh, far easier to write a hex float uh, importer than a decimal float importer yourself. But I mean, you you could just use stir to d like I'm doing. Um, all right. Um, let me let me just. Someone's asking about token mod, or if I'm setting token mod and scan it. Um, nope, that's a good point. Um, I guess we should validate um, some of that stuff in our tests. Token mod should have a non-value. So you must have missed it. Um, all right. Okay. So what's the next step? So let's let's see what we checked off here in our uh, syntax file. So we have identifiers from last time. We actually, we were very, we were overachievers. <laughs> so we also did, um, I guess I should just say plane zero or zero followed by, um, to just like this, or zero B followed by, this. So I think that's what we did. And for floats, I think what we learned is that the dot is actually optional. And I'm still not going to write down the full regex for this stuff. So for now, let's just leave it like that approximate thing of what a valid character thing is, a string thing. Okay. Um, so actually, I think the, what we just covered is by far the hardest part of the lexer. So if that seemed, I mean, it wasn't, was it that intense? Uh, not too bad, right? Like the standard programming, um, I think. Maybe we have some bugs, but uh, not not like fancy advanced stuff that, that no one can understand, I hope. Um, and so really the rest of it, lexing wise, is going to be downhill because we just need to go through and make everything correspond to these different tokens. Uh, so what's someone saying something about my float regex? Dot as a valid one. Yeah, 
I'll revisit these. Like, so, so this is really just for my own guide. Um, when I'm doing this kind of lexing and parsing implementation, I just like to have a little more concise uh, format to guide my thinking, but it, it's not necessarily like a formal spec. It's just like something to kind of get me started. And if I find the regex becomes too gnarly to encapsulate all the cases, uh, I will generally just leave that sort of uh, leave that looser. All right. <clears throat> Oh, so yeah, maybe uh, let's do comments as well. Actually, comments are kind of a special case of a two-character thing, where that's an extension of a one-character thing, so maybe we should just start doing a whole bunch of those. Um, let me just see if I like the order of these things. So put the meaty stuff up at top. Um, Yes, that's what really we should do. No, because we have to. Okay, test all run. Um, So after scanning, we look for it. And then, okay, I think that looks reasonable. This also looks reasonable for now. And um, so let's just start doing the whole Sioux of stuff. Um, so probably just going to make a paste in here so I have something to look at. Okay, that was not where I wanted to paste it exactly. Um, so, so let's just start with one as a template. Uh, so if you see a single plus, uh, you have to do look ahead. And so you look at the next character and, well, also do this since we don't know what we're looking at. Uh, if there's another plus, then the token kind is going to be, uh, oh, and I guess I didn't add that. Maybe this is a good template. Um, so it's similar to the old one, but then if it's actually followed by some uh, extension character, then we actually use a different token instead. Um, Maybe we should do a macro for this because it's going to get very repetitive. Um, are there things that can be extended with more than one character? Let me think. Yeah, plus equals. So let's do a few archetypes and then um, See. 
you know what, I'd like to refactor later because when you start thinking too much about refactoring in, in, in the middle of something, you just lose velocity when uh, sometimes just bringing through is, is not so such a bad idea. So um, let's just do them and then we will revisit. A lot of this could also be table driven. And let's not even worry about it. Let's just do the the big manual thing. It's going to be pretty error prone now. Okay, so let's say let's go for a macro. I'm already getting tired of this shit. <clears throat> Um, so this case, what's the unique data? It's something like the plus and the plus and this. And so you want something like token ink, uh, token add assign, something like that. Um, let's see. Flex case or token case um, let's say c1 c through kind of let's say k1 for kind one c2 for kind two and it's going to It's going to be a fucking nightmare to, to step through. That's the problem with macros. <clears throat> um, let's call this case two. Just case two. It's going to be a local macro. Um, and we'll also do a case one. See if these macros compile. Let's see how bad it is. Pull on a sign, okay. Um, yeah, let me let me go and add a bunch of these cases here. First, so let me just go through and add all of them.
All right, looks like the stream went down. I'm not sure if the stream is back up. Let's see what. All right, looks like the stream, or looks like my internet connection momentarily went down. The recording should still be continuous. Uh, so I don't know what you guys missed, but I just put out my case macros. Your OBS, I noticed. Um, and so now I'm just going to do everything. So um, plus let's do colon. So colon, I guess I only have two. Or, so it can be either a st straight up colon or it can be a colon equals, in which case it's a token uh, colon assign. Um, then there are cases like plus, which have both an equals case um, and a increment case. Just check if that works. I don't want to write like 100 macros if it turns out we have to restructure all that stuff anyway. Um, so what did we just do? Colon, colon assign, uh, plus, plus assign, plus, plus. So assert token colon assert token token colon assign There's way too much stuff that's working in our first try. I always get suspicious. I mean, but I guess it is simple code. But all right. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth, I guess. Um, so let's just do all the other cases. So another case is and. And there's also and assign. And there's also straight up and and or just or sign or or um, there's this can either be extended to token L shift. Um, and I guess that can actually be extended even further. So maybe let's do those manually. Those are, I think there's only two of those. Um,
at least to put that stuff up there so that all the, the more explicit is up front and then the rest is down here. Uh, okay, so we have to do Imitation here is trash. It's because Visual Studio is probably we can. I don't know. Anyway, star. Either be a deref, a multiplier, or a mall sign. Then we have this. Then we have this. Dip mall sign, add a sign, div a sign, make dip, then we do those, this, this, then do XOR. Oh, actually, in this case, is even more complicated. Um, token this then equals what the heck was that? Um, yeah, so it's definitely good we pulled this out because there's a bunch of different extensions. Um, so these uniform cases are nice and tight. Um, let's see if we missed anything. Just run. Nothing exploded. <sighs> I guess let's not do everything right now, but at least let's exercise some kind of random sampling. Like, uh, I would like to make sure that uh, this and this kind of stuff works. And I think that's it for the Lexer. I mean, not that it's done, but what I want to do, unless we run into bugs. So let me just see if people caught anything up, uh, anything serious with the bugs. All right, let's see here. Uh, uh. Yeah, I think uh, other people on the chat are already answering those questions uh, that someone earlier asked. Uh, if you look at um, deck, for example, unary minus is, is at, at, a, at lexing time, there's no difference between unary minus and binary minus. That's purely a parse time distinction. Um, and I mean, we, we won't allow this as a valid uh, minus minus. This, this won't mean that. 
which even if you could make it work would be confusing to C programmers. So this this will actually just be unexpected token because minus minus can only occur, like uh, the decrement token can only occur in a statement context as a postfix. So you can add some error productions to help people with that, but uh, it's not ambiguous or uh, misleading now, right now at least, I think. Um, you know, in hindsight, we maybe didn't need these macros, but honestly, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think this is too bad at all with the macros. Like, it's very schematic. If I ever have to step through these, uh, I will probably regret that, regret that statement, but uh, th this code should be simple enough that it's not really a site of frequent debugging and stepping. All right. Let me just then, so I think I'll, I'll say we're done with the Lexer and I'm going to move to parsing now, which is actually going to be easier, if you can believe it. Because if you choose your grammar right, then, I mean, it, it's not totally true, but you can definitely make parsing more mechanical and less kind of case analysis heavy than Lexing. You, as you can see with Lexing, there's often a lot of case analysis and stuff like that. Uh, and careful edge cases, not all of which I handled, but at least, you know, it, it's that kind of code. It's a little more dense in that sense. Parsing tends to be a little more kind of just kind of, you know, just kind of straightforward uh, code. So let me just uh, hang out for a few minutes and then we'll, uh, as a natu natural stopping point for beginning the parsing. And then uh, if there's any questions, I'll also answer those in the meantime. Without any empty parentheses, you mean you mean like this for dis, uh, for ambiguity? Um, I generally don't do that for these very localized macros that are not reusable, that are just intended for a very specific purpose. I don't usually harden those. I just make them straightforward like this. Um, I'm less concerned about this code. I mean, this is readable as well, but I'm more concerned about um, this code here. Like I want people to be able to sort of look at this grammar and see the structure. And I think we meet that goal right now. I mean, you have to know what case one means, but even you can probably guess if you just look at it honestly, um, but yeah. By the way, this is, I would say like the idea of case macros, like macros, these very localized macros for defining cases of a switch statement, it's a pretty common technique and it can definitely come in handy. I mean, obviously some people have different stomachs for macros uh, and we won't have macros in ION. And as you can see, I have no problems using macros. So it's it's gonna be a little bit hard for me to give up, but uh, maybe that's an example of how I'm not just putting my, my favorite features into ION. Uh, it's actually gonna hurt for me as well because I do like having the ability to just do stuff like this. Uh, even, you know, I know some people have a, a deep aversion to macros. Audio should be back on. <clears throat> Just taking a second to think about what the right place to start with the parsing is. So we can start from two angles. Um, 
I'll start from one that may seem counterintuitive. I'm not going to start from the parsing. I'm going to start from the AST. And the reason is that unlike the lexing where it's pretty easy to write unit tests, um, once you start generating recursive structures, it's going to be harder to validate those structures. Um, and so I think it's going to make more sense to, to, def to define the AST data structure first, maybe not every single case, but at least the skeleton, and then write some sort of function that dumps out an AST as, a, as expression. That's what I usually do for these sorts of parsers. So if you guys remember homework two, the, the payoff for homework two was you write a parser and you spit out an S expression. And the S expression is just, uh, it's just, you know, kind of a flat representation or it's not flat. It's sort of a parenthetical parenthesis based Lisp style representation of a recursive data structure. Um, and uh, my hope is, so maybe let me, um, you know, my hope is maybe if you have something like, uh, what's an example? Suppose we define a factorial function and um, it ends up looking, by the way, we're not going to do the semicolon elision at first. We're just going to do semicolons, which are valid in any case uh, for, for the first pass. And then we'll do the, the semicolon insertion afterwards, which is quite simple, but I don't want to get caught up in it now. Um, so yeah, if you if you do something like this, uh, and you parse it, um, that when you dump the AS corresponding AST to a, an S expression, you would probably want to have something that looks a little bit like a Lisp program, a weird, or not really Lisp, but something vaguely Lisp-like. Um, so something like this. Do parenthesis counting. My editor is not helping me. All my editors do parenthesis counting. I don't know why this one doesn't. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But yeah, um, so the idea is that if we just start writing the parser and we start feeding programs to it uh, and we just generate these in memory data structures, we don't really have a good way of looking at them as a human and making sense of does this actually match my expected parsing? Um, and so um, by kind of defining the structure first, writing the dumper first to this kind of text format, uh, it means that once we actually start doing parsing tests, we will get something like this as output. And initially we'll be able to just eyeball it and say, yeah, that totally looks like what I expected. Um, but then later on when we do more automated tests, we can also use this in a test suite where we basically just, uh, we, we instrument the compiler. Like if you pass a certain flag, uh, to the parser is going to spit out these S expression ASTs. And then you can just have like a script that basically does, says, you know, here's my expected text. Is it the text I got? And, you know, and maybe once we get further along, you can do more flexible matching the way LVM does it for its kind of text-based uh, regression testing. But, but, but anyway, the idea is that having a good text representation up front, it means that we're not stuck in the debug window trying to drill down 10 levels into an AST structure to figure out whether it, it's exactly what we expect. So hopefully that makes sense uh, as to why we're, uh, we're actually going to do the basic AST and AST printing first rather than uh, after parsing, because otherwise we're just not going to have anything to debug with usefully. <clears throat> All right, so let's just jump right in. Uh, yeah, so may, uh, let's talk about the grammar. Um, so um, the grammar, a lot of it, the expression grammar, except for the presidents and this, the fact that some things have become statements rather than expressions, most of it is obviously quite similar to C, um, but um, but simpler, much simpler. Um, so I don't have anything prepared. The, when I was thinking through the grammar, I kind of made a napkin sketch of a lot of stuff. And then I just drilled down into the problem areas and made sure that I had s solutions for them. But the rest of it uh, should be easy to just sort of develop on our own. And if, if, if any of you have forgotten roughly what ION looks like, let me just bring up the, okay, that's not the right one. 
it's something like this. Um, so a compilation unit or a, just a .ion file has at the top level a sequence of declarations. Each declaration is headed off by a keyword and uh, most of the keywords are the same as C. So if you want to declare an enum, it starts with enum followed by an identifier followed by a list of stuff. Uh, in this example, I'm assuming we have uh, kind of magic new lines that insert commas or semicolons, but in our initial version, we won't do that. We will have explicit commas and semicolons. So, you know, it will be more like this, uh, and this will be more like this. Um, but yeah, so, and, and I, obviously the big difference is that the way types look, type declarations look is, or, the way variable declarations and field declarations look is that you have the name of the, the, the thing to be declared, and then you have the type after uh, separated by a semicolon. Uh, but yeah, vars, consts, functions. Um, and then the statement syntax is basically familiar. Um, president's table is different as described in the ion doc. Uh, you have these colon assignments, which are just synonyms for var. Uh, but only in a statement context, not in a global top-level declaration context. Uh, you can do stuff like this. One thing that I changed after the stream is that you can't do that anymore because commas are used in this, in this case for two things, both for separating parameters. Like It means that if you do something like this, um, it's not ambiguous to the parser what the grouping should be, but it's too flat to a human reader. So. Uh, I decided that was not a good idea. So we're so this is what a function declaration looks like. Uh, parameter name fo followed by colon, followed by type specifier, and then optional comma saver list of other parameters. Um, so that I mean we're just going to develop that bottom up the, the EBNF ourselves. But I just wanted to remind you guys what it looks like. Um, we may not cover every case the first pass through, but we're going to get you know, 80 or 90 percent in the first pass uh, that we do today, hopefully. All right. Um, so the top level thing is a declaration. Um, and so what can we have? We can have an enum. We can have a struct. I guess structs and unions are probably the same syntactically for the rest. Um, we can have vars. Um, I'm just going to factor out the the rest of those. We can have cons. We can have funks. And we can have type defs. Um, type def should probably be more like here. Yep. Um, an enum decal is a name followed by uh, the followed by open and then um, I guess can be empty so a bunch of enum items um, enum items can either be so one enum item is going to be like either a name well a name optionally followed by an expression. Um, and then items are going to be like it's an item and then a bunch of commas separated. Um, things followed by, I guess, an optional final comma, something like this. Um, but the whole thing can be empty. Uh, for aggregate, we're going to have a name. And a curly brace. And then a field. Uh, say an aggregate field. Like this. Uh, 
I guess it's really just, let's maybe simplify it. Um, let's say something like this, zero or more fields. And the field is going to be um, a name list. And the name list is going to be either a name, at least one name followed by zero or more other names separated by commas and a colon and a type. Um, let's define what a type is. A type is either a name. Okay, I didn't mean to write a colon. Equals for all of those. Um, okay, so a type can either be a flat name or let's see here. Probably has recursive structure, right? So it can be some kind of base type, which can be a name, or another thing like this. Uh, or a func, followed by a type list, followed by. list is um, so it's an optional type list so it's either just one item followed by zero one or more items um, something like this uh, and then a base type followed by um, some sort of array size specifier or followed by one of these for pointers and should, let me think here. So if you do int star star, the way this parse is, int, it should left associate, so it should be like this. So it's uh, left associative, so it should be one or zero or more of those. Um, and in terms of those other base type options, um, if you, if you do something like this, that's going to uh, means it is the return value. This is optional. It is the return type. Uh, whereas if you do, I guess this is optional because you can leave out if it's a void return. Um, if you do something like this, or if you do this and then that, it binds differently. So that's the basic idea with the binding. Um, so let's see how this parses. The base type is going to gobble up all of this stuff um, including the square brackets. And so when we return, there's nothing left to gobble up. It's already done. But if it's open paren and closed, it should be like this. Um, then it will do it like this. Okay. So I think that checks out. Um, Okay, so that, that was pushing the stack a little too much. Let's go up. So where were we using that? We were using that in aggregate field. So we had an aggregate field. It's a list of comma separated names followed by a colon, followed by a type. Um, let's just say that's actually part of, not part of it. So it looks like this. Probably it's worth factoring out this name list. Um, Okay, so enums, aggregates, let's do var decals. Um, so a var decal is a name followed by, um, let's see, an optional type. 
um, if you don't specify the type, you have to specify a value to infer the type from. So it, it either, let's see how to, how to express that syntactically. You can just do this. Um, uh, or type um, Well, maybe let's write it out more explicitly and not try to factor out all the stuff. So you can you can do this. Something like this. I think it works. semicolons for that. Um, so that's, I think, var decals. Uh, and then const decals are a similar deal, except there's no explicit types. Um, and then type defs are just like this. Uh, and funks are name. Uh, Funk param func parameter list. So func parameter list consists of um, a func param followed by a bunch of these. The func param is a name, semicolon, and then a type. Um, and then an optional return type, which is otherwise, if elided, inferred as void. And then uh, a curly brace body, which is going to be a, not a statement list, it's called a statement block. I want to reserve the word list for something comma separated. Um, so let's call this a block of statements, which are going to be separated by semicolons. Um, and by the way, I'm sure all of these have issues. Once we start implementing it, it will become evident. This is just kind of so you can see how I develop a grammar. And honestly, I didn't prepare this. Like This is just based on me thinking at a loose level about the grammar uh, in terms of example programs I've written down and stuff and just kind of internalized it, and then developing the grammar from that uh, so, I guess like set of examples that are floating around my head. So this is kind of how you can do it. And it's not going to be perfect the first pass, but then you implement it and you notice things and you debug it and it becomes eventually solid. All right. Um, so I think that covers all the declarations. Now we have to start doing um, statements. So a statement can be either, um, maybe let's not do everything at once. What does is, what is in good cases start with? Well, it can be in a return. It can be uh, an if. Um, actually, and let's internalize those curly braces into the statement block because they're always required for us. Um, And I'm going to use a way of writing it that's technically L2, but we'll factor it in the actual implementation in a way that's L1. So you can have uh, zero or more else if blocks. Um, this, this should probably be split out into the smaller productions, but I'm just going to write it in one line for now. Um, zero or more else if blocks. Um, then an, an optional else block. While is going to be um, it's 
just this. I'm going to semicolon separate that. Um, or is going to be what I call a statement list, which is a comma separated list of statements, which works. I'll talk about that in a sec. That's something, that's one of those things I thought through a little bit in advance because I realized there would be an issue with some of the changes we made to C's grammar. Uh, so we have a statement list for the initializer, then we have a um, another, we have a conditional, and then we have a update iterator statement list as well. And then we have a statement block. Um, and we have a do while loop. Um, and what else do we need? Well, certainly we need actual expressions. Um, and expressions can be followed by what I'll call an assign op. Uh, optionally, and then an ex maybe an expression. So let's say ink or deck for an assign op followed by an expression. This is optional. And so an assign op is, well, I think you know them. It's uh, this or what is it? Add assign, it's uh, colon assign and all of these guys. So it's all of these. So these have been moved to the statement level rather than the C expression level uh, so far. Uh, and, and so we have to handle them here rather than in the expression grammar. And uh, one thing you'll note is that syntactically I'm treating colon, I said that colon assign is actually sort of equivalent to var, uh, but without an explicit type. So it's like the type inferencing variable declaration and initialization. Um, Syntactically, we actually treat it like any other assignment operator, um, but in the case, but but it has a special syntactic, it has a special constraint, which is the left-hand side has to be a simple name. So you can, you know, you can write this, uh, you can write this, but you can't write like this. Um, but it will make the grammar and the implementation simpler as we, is if we parse these as the same, and then once we parse them, we just validate that if it's a colon assign, the left-hand side is actually a, na a name expression rather than some arbitrary thing. Um, so it's just a convenient factoring that kind of works out in practice very well. All right, um, so it's something like this. And what else did we miss? Let me just think about, like, let's look at our own C program and just see if there's stuff. Oh yeah, we switches. We should need, we, we need to do switches. Um, actually, let me defer switches. Um, nah, let's not defer switches. Let's do switches. Um, So a case can be either, um, so it could be a reserved word. I'm just going to call it case. Oh, we haven't done those either in the Lexer. We haven't done, we can do those kind of especially tagged identifiers and maybe we'll do that. But anyway, um, so a case is a case followed by this, followed by a colon, um, or it's default. So the default reserved word followed by colon. I mean, you can factor it like this, I guess. Um, and you can have zero or more of those, then followed by um, it's not really statement block because you don't want to force curly braces. So maybe we need to factor cur uh, we need to factor statement block into. Um, Well, you can just say this, zero or more. Um, 
zero or more statements. Um, something like this. The other thing we need to do is break and continue. Let's not do go to for now. Uh, oh, optional braces. Yeah. So that's interesting. If you use naked braces, the way I'm doing compound literals right now, it's ambiguous. Of course, it's pretty easy to just have it mean a statement block. Yeah, let's have that for doing scopes with, that are not associated with ifs or whiles or whatever. So it should probably be up here. Put these up to the top. Um, by the way, I'm sure some of these things have uh, have have issues, but I'm just trying to get some coverage. Um, okay, let's look at our let's look at more of our C code to just see if there's stuff we would want to cover. So we have cases, whiles, and breaks. Um, so we're just looking at statements for now. We're going to do expressions last. Expressions are probably the most complicated, or actually, I guess we covered expression grammars pretty well in our homework and, and last week. So uh, there's a good chance that uh, it won't be too difficult. All right. I think that's enough for the statements. I'm sure we left out stuff, but it's enough. Um, okay, so for the uh, for the expressions, one thing I realized uh, after the stream, way back on the president's table, um, is that since we support the ternary operator, uh, it has to be lower presidents. But the ternary operator's presidents is really straightforward. You don't really have, like most C programmers don't even think of the ternary operator as having precedence. It just kind of works, except when it doesn't. So uh, one notorious case is the comma operator has even lower precedence than ternary in C, which leads to a lot of bugs. Um, like I had one in the first program, uh, the first program I wrote on stream, I fixed it quickly, but it was in one of the macros where the binding relative between the ternary and the comma was, was not what I was intuitively expecting. Fortunately, we won't have that here since we don't have a comma operator. Um, but yeah, ternary is at the bottom. Uh, actually, I think there's some stuff I didn't fill in here, right? Um, what was what I was thinking of ternary and... All right, let's just say that's it for now. So yeah, ternary. Uh, so ternary is going to be the lowest precedence, and uh, the way that's going to work is, so what's the next one up? The next one up is or expression. So you have an or expression and it's followed by a question mark. Then you have a ternary, uh, and uh, so we expect another expression. Uh, well, another ternary expression. It's right associative or whatever you want to call it. Uh, not, it's a little bit weird interpretation of this, but um, something like this. Uh, and this is optional. Um, and this doesn't need repetition because it's right associative. So we, we you know, and some for the left associative stuff, we always use the the repetition operator. But because this is actually right recursive, uh, just optional. This kind of optional match is fine because once it recurses in here, it can do more matches of ternaries within there. So for example, if you do uh this one uh or a and or else x equals uh b or something like that um this will work because 
this part here will be another ternary expert, and so it can match another ternary thing. And we'll should gobble that thing up. So I think that's right. Uh, and for the or expression, uh, yeah, that's just or. So and, and all these are left associative basically from now on, all the binary operators. This is going to be and expert, and then zero or more ors of those guys. Uh, So it's sort of the same pattern repeating itself. This should start to look familiar. This is what we did before. Uh, and then here it should be some sort of comparator, comparator operator. And uh, a compar oh, comparison, comparison. <laughs> comparison operator is um, EQ, not EQ. What else? Let's say that's it. Um, and then a mall expression is going to be same pattern. I'm calling it mall is really things with multiplier like presidents. But it's a nice semantic grouping rather than just calling them 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, or whatever. At least that's how I like to do it. Um, and mull up is uh, oh, should be add up. Add up is uh, then a multiplication expression is going to be now we're down kind of down to a I guess we need unary as well, so let's call it unary expression. Uh mul up unary expression. Mullop is going to be and then unary is going to be some sort of right associative prefix operator optionally. So if you have one of, let's see, what are the, it's either ampersand for taking the address, it's like plus minus ampersand DREF. Let's just take those for now. Um, and if we match that, we can match another unary expression. So you can do, you know, star, star, you, you can do DREF, DREF pointer or something like that. Uh, or it's a base expression. And a base expression is going to be, so now we're getting near the bottom, but we still have stuff that binds tighter that uh, is like function calls and um, indexing and field selection. So you want to probably have some sort of even, even lower level uh, expression thing. Um, something like this. And so you can have this operand expression and then it can be followed by optionally um, an expression list. This is for a function call or a single expression in square brackets or a dot and a name for field selection. Um, and I guess these are going to s be left associative. Let's let's just work that out. So if I do f, a, and b, so suppose f of a actually returns a function pointer and you want to call that, this is left associative. Yep, 
So this is the right grouping. And the same, I guess, is true here. A, B, C is actually A, B, and then C. And A, I, J is A, I, J. Okay. So yeah, those are associative, left associative like they should be. And then when we come down to the bottom, we have, um, let's see, we have uh, names, ints, floats. Well, let's write them on separate lines. Uh, could all, we could call all these literals. Um, uh, int float, uh, what do we have? Stir, char is not technically a separate token type, so uh, literals, and then we have names, uh, and then we have, um, we have stuff that's bracketed or not bracketed, parenthesized. And then we have compound literals. Uh, and compound literals, oh, and so you can use, you can use implicitly typed compound literals, which are just like an expression context, just a curly brace without anything preceding it. And then in here, we're not going to do named fields in pass one, so I'm just gonna do an expression list, uh, which is comma separated and uh, like that um, but this thing can also i guess technically that's a literal let's not break this out into a separate rule let's just say like this um, something like this and this is optional in here so the idea behind this, let's, let me start doing some, some, maybe some line breaks. No, that's fine, to me at least. So the idea behind this is if you do, um, so for example, suppose you have a, a var v vector, and then you do uh, one comma two, you don't have to specify the type of this compound literal, it knows from context that it's a, um, you know, if this was C99, you would have to do something like this, um, but it knows from context that it's a vector, so you don't have to specify, so you can just use na naked compound literals like that in an expression context, and then the type checker will validate that the context is sufficient to know what type that is. But you can also, for example, or this is not right, you would use like that, but you could also do this, for example. Um, For example, um, where there's this, a simple name, like a, a name and then the compound literal, in which case this specifies what I call a simple type, which is just a type that's designated by a simple name. Um, so that's the reasoning there. OK, let's talk about an, an area that I intentionally didn't cover syntactically in the original intro stream to Ion, because it's 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 a little bit ugly, and I think it would turn off people before they had a chance to appreciate some of the other aspects potentially. Uh, and that's uh, one of the problems in C that makes it really annoying to parse is the fact that there are a lot of contexts where you don't know uh, whether you're dealing with a type specifier or an expression. Um, so for example, uh, in C, if you have something like this, um, you know, in theory, this could be a variable foo multiplied by the deref, 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 deref pointer of something that would be syntactically valid, I think. Um, but it could also be actually foo is a type def, and this is a type cast to foo pointer, 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 pointer. And so kind of notoriously in C for cases like this, in order to even know what kind of syntactic production you're dealing with in an expression context, you actually need to have symbol table data about, you know, is this name uh, bound to a type tag, right? Stuff like that. Um, and so that's a disaster. And we get away from some of that by just our basic declaration syntax for variables, for example. Um, but in in a very, ex, you know, in an expression context for things like casts and also for compound literals with more complex types, um, there needs to be a token to set off the type specifier to know that you're dealing with a type specifier so that simple table dependent parsing is not a constraint. 
All right. So um, what that means in practical terms is this is tentative, but it's the best I could come up with. Um, let me give you two cases. First size of, um, size of 40, well, so in C, there are these two different cases. This is a sort of primer on the more general case in a in a expression context. But in the size of operator, you can actually use two different kinds of arguments. You can either use an expression, and then the the meaning is you know whatever the size of whatever data type associated with that expression, that's the size I want. But you can also just specify a type, which is actually a different syntactic entity and also a different semantic entity. Um, and so we can't do this nakedly. So what I have chosen to do is if you want to do something like this, where um, you know you can do you can do something like this, and that's fine. But if you want to do something like size of uh, something else, you do this. So this would be. Uh, size of a uh, an array of 16 integers so this would be you know 16 times size of int basically would be the result of this evaluation um, and so the basic syntax that i try to use across the cases is anytime you have an open paren that immediately followed by a colon um, that basically sets off a general type specifier in an expression context where otherwise it would be ambiguous. And so, um, and this is pretty mononic. Like, trust me, this is not the first thing I came up with. I had a bunch of really ugly ver uh, alternative ideas syntactically. This was by, this is the, the result of, of me hitting everything else. Actually, when I finally came up with this was the moment I decided that Maybe we could start bit, bitwise. Like I was working on this a few weeks before the thing started, so it's not too bad. Anyway, um, but yeah. So the idea is that uh, a sort of prefix uh, colon sets off a type specifier, and so uh, let me show some examples. So if you want to, uh, if you want to do this, that's fine. But suppose you want to have a vector of v's, a, a, a vector of a, a, an array of vectors, you can't do this because um, this syntax only takes simple type names uh, and there's no way you can parse general type specifiers because of the aforementioned issues without some sort of setting off. And so you have to do this, um, which is not too bad in my opinion. And I think it's pretty, it's pretty mnemonic with a prefix dot because it means that normally when you see, a, or not prefix dot, prefix colon, because it means when you see a prefix colon, it's always, it's always in a, uh, so like you kind of know to expect a type. So it sort of tags types nicely in a context where it might otherwise not be super clear. But but this makes the job easy for the parser. Um, and this is this is just for that case. Um, so if someone's asking us to maybe answer questions before jumping further. What type does type of return though? I, I do have type of, but that we'll cover that later. My type of is mostly, uh, my, my type of is designed for reifying static type information at runtime for type introspection. At least that's the current plan. It, so it's not really, it's it's nice to have something like type of if you're doing metaprogramming, like you have templates or something, but if you don't have that, then it's still useful to be able to say something like, uh, you know, type, uh, int info type of int. So it's basically, and in this context, you have to use it as well, um, where this basically just means I want a runtime, rep a pointer to the runtime representation of the type info uh, for that type. And you can use it, you know, you can use it with something else as well. But anyway, that's how that works. Um, so uh, not a complete overview of every corner of the syntax, but that, that covers some of that stuff that's nasty where you have to intermingle type specifiers and expressions. Um, all right. So what, what's the, what does this mean in concrete terms? 
uh, if I want, so someone's asking if you want X to be the same type as Y, um, sorry, uh, I guess you can declare it as X colon type of Y. Uh, I guess I, I guess I could give type of a different meaning in a type context and an expression context. Uh, that might be worth doing, but the, the, that kind of thing seems more useful to me when you're writing template type programs where things are fully parameterized. Um, but I haven't thought through all of it, but I, I think that would be easy to support, but the, not too concerned about cases like that, I suppose, um, in terms of type genericity, but it might be worth doing, but uh, probably not going to do it for now. All right. So... Um, that's the, I just needed that digression to, to con contextualize this because otherwise it would look needlessly unfamiliar. But uh, if you know enough about parsing and cease in particular, uh, you, you'll know that this is a pretty small fix for what is otherwise a pretty uh, tr a, a pretty fatal flaw in the parsability of C. So this is what I settled with. This is for um, just type names, right? So um, just like vector can occur here. This is, in some sense, a type specifier. And so you could also have written, you know, you could have written this. Um, but this is not like a cast. So um, it, it's, it's not a cast to do this. I mean, like, this is not really, uh, I've, de I've decided not to make this a cast. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I'll change my mind. Right now, I'm just doing casts like this um, because casts are going to be fairly rare, uh, even even though it's a systems language, because we're going to have explicit conversions. So you can do stuff like, you know, you can you can do you can do stuff like this. So if, if you have a U8 um, that's like 42, then you can do this, and uh, you can just convert it, kind of making it look like a function. Uh, and most of the time, you'll be using conversions, kind of like in C++, rather than casting. So casting is only really reserved for hardcore stuff like um, casting, um, I don't know, uh, casting, I don't know, maybe const pointer. Um, so if const pointer is a... Or that's not a good example. Let's take a void pointer. I guess maybe they are explicitly cast. That's a good example. Okay, you int. Um, so you is a you int putter of like some random thing, and you want to cast it to a pointer. That's really the kind of case where you need casts. Um, and I might end up just lighting this if that that might make sense, actually. And I, th this would work, actually. Like you could totally do it this way, and it would be very C-like. So maybe I should just do this. To be honest, let me think about that for a sec. It it means though that like oh I don't like it because the problem is. If you have, uh, yeah, I remember, I think I thought this through. If you have something like this versus uh, when you're just using it as a constructor, like this this looks too similar, but they have different meanings because one of them is an actual cast, like a hard C style cast, and the other one is just like an explicit constructor uh, for a given type. So I think uh, reserving something like uh, the cast, you know, a cast keyword. I, I know that Jai is using cast and Odin and a few others. So I, I don't. I think that might be a good idea. Uh, we could also use a prefix. This is the other thing I thought of. You could also use a prefix. Like you could do something like this, but uh, I don't know. Uh, let's just use the cast one for now. I think that's the easiest way to do it. But anyway, so um, the thing that can actually, so with that digression out of the way, let's return to this whole syntax. Um, we're going to define something I call a type specifier or just a type spec, and it can either be a just a simple name or it can be um, this kind of sandwiched uh, type. And uh, then you can have type specs. Actually, and this is really what this is about. You can have type specs. Um, 
followed by this. Let's see. Um, This is a little bit redundant with the other stuff, but let's leave that. Um, let's not do the constructor case for now. Let's just, or let's do the constructor case, but not the function like case. So this is the only type spec uh, instance we we're dealing with in this context, and then we also need. Um, cast uh, let's put this up here cast I guess it's maybe a little bit different um, I guess the parens are already there Some of this stuff has to be factored, by the way, to be L1 parsable, but it, so that you know we, we consume this and then we check whether the next thing is a colon, and if it is, then it's a type specifier, otherwise, blah, 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 it's something else. So this is not fully L1 factored as is. Uh, we're gonna have to do a little bit of that once we uh, get to... Um, someone suggesting an infix, uh, an infix colon, that doesn't work. I, I, th I thought about it. The problem with infix colon is it conflicts with things like the ternary operator. Uh, Oh, and that also also doesn't help because you don't know that you're dealing with a uh, a type in your syntax you're suggesting. So 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 someone in the chat is suggesting this syntax um, that doesn't work. The problem is when you see an open paren in an expression context, you don't know whether the next thing that follows is a normal expression or a type specifier, and so that's why you need a prefix. So this it doesn't work for that reason, and the, yeah, that's actually the reason this doesn't work. All right. Um, I guess we can make cast not use. Maybe cast is always just a type without. I'll revisit that. Uh, I, I was. Yeah. All right. Let's say that's it. Um, so it's a cast and then followed by an expression. Um, let's let's revisit the operand expressions, literals, simple literals, names, casts. Casts would be further down the list for sure. Um, I'll write it like this. And we'll refactor it to take into account the actual. LL1 parsability, but this is the semantic structure, so an optional type spec followed by a compound literal thing, uh, a cast, like this, it's parens. Something like this, I think, is we're, we're kind of getting there. Um, how long has the stream been live? I started streaming at 8 and it's now 11.15, so it's three hours and change but um, all the prep work we're doing here with the, you know, the BNF is going to make it much easier to write uh, well first it will help us find the inventory of different kinds of AST notes we need um, but then when we start writing the parser it will also be pretty straightforward so I suggest we just actually maybe we should reorganize our source files because I feel like we're getting enough, enough source code now that it might be worth splitting things up just for my own sanity um, and will also let me show one of my standard, I, I mean, I don't know if it's a good idea, but it's something I like to do when I'm kind of uh, trying to develop things quickly. Uh, so let's basically try to refactor a bunch of this stuff. So right now we have a main function. 
Um, so let's put this into a separate file. And um, for now, we're just going to include the existing file. Oh, it's one of the annoying things. Yeah, the thing that's annoying about this with Visual Studio is it auto compiles stuff, which I don't really like. Um, I should move these to headers. Or sorry, not this one. That will also solve the problem. Oh yeah, that is what I usually do. All right. Um, it's been a while since I used a lot of Visual Studio actually. Okay, so now it won't find it, um, but that's not too bad. I guess we can add that back. Okay, so it's still compiling that in. I guess it's doing it based on extension, which is pretty annoying. What the trick is? I, God, I used to do this all the time. It's normal. It's easy in a normal build system, but Visual Studio is a little too smart about including stuff uh, for compilation. But basically, what I like to do is just to have a single uh, file that includes everything, so I don't have to worry about headers and uh, redundant uh, includes and stuff like that. But I have to remember how to actually uh, convince it to stop including stuff. Okay, that's not what I want to do. Class wizard is definitely not what I wanted to do. Okay, so. I don't want to call it .h just so it stops it stupid. Let's just do that for now. You can do a drag select. Okay, better. <clears throat> um, so we'll probably put a, have a common file with all these general utilities, uh, and then I'll put everything related to the Lexer in a file. I guess that's all we have right now, but that's maybe a good. Um, I'm going to rename, to rename ion.c to um, common. Um, Actually, let's just call it ion, make sure it compiles. Oh yeah, so this needs to be. Actually, I guess it doesn't have to be in the headers. It just has to be marked for include, like exclusion. Oh, God. Okay. 
works. Um, okay, let's just rename this file. Yeah, so I, I used to have a setup with, with a special pre-authored uh, project file, solution file, that actually gave me this behavior by default where things were explicitly excluded by default and only one file was manually included. Uh, I guess I can actually make that now. But, uh, but if you do that, this is a pretty nice way of refactoring stuff. And if you're not working in something like Visual Studio, uh, this lets you have a single I mean, the idea behind this is uh, actually let's, uh, let's test something here. Um, so, so the nice thing about this is, okay, I didn't commit it. Uh, let's do that. Just do a big commit. Uh, I'll clean it up later with rebase or something. Uh, what happened to Lex? Oh God, did it put it somewhere else? Visual Studio. This is the part of Visual Studio no one likes, of course. Yeah, it's like, why are you putting these files rather than the thing I pointed you to? Those are idiots. So, And let's just add it back in. Um, I will just add the original. No folder. No, that's not what I wanted. This is Let's see if it can find them. <sighs> yeah, this is pretty stupid. Um, I'll clean up the commit message, code from stream day four. And uh, 
I guess the old one, the old one is still around. Um, so yeah, if you build main, okay. It's one of my least favorite things. Is the whole issue with format specifiers. But I should do something about that. Let me remind myself what the pound define is. It's a stupid macro. Oh, the other thing I should say is that I usually, when, you, when I'm writing code in this style, I pull this stuff out like that. Um, This is so bad. I mean, this has always been one of my least favorite uh, parts about printf. It's a major problem. Oh, that's not what I meant. Um, get add. Where's that file? Okay. So that works. <clears throat> All right, that was a digression. But if I had pushed that code, people would have gotten, I'm sure, errors on GCC. So it's good that I fixed it. Um, but yeah, I'm not a, not a fan of how that was handled in C. But I guess they were kind of. The, the explicitly sized types arrive very late in C's evolution. It was a C99 feature, and so I guess they maybe didn't have options for addressing it better, but it seems weird that you couldn't just do, uh, I guess the specific syntax would be invalid, but you know what I mean, like some, some, some format specifier that embeds the size in the string rather than using string interpolation with macros. That seems weird to me. Anyway. All right, uh, so that was a distraction. So common, lex, and main. Okay, so let's um, create and try not to add it in the wrong directory this time. 
Visual Studio. Um, AST.C. <clears throat> So let's go back to our syntax file and start getting a handle on the different things we'll need. So we'll definitely need um, some sort of declaration type, some sort of expression type, <clears throat> some sort of statement type, and each of these are tagged unions, discriminated unions, some types, whatever you like to call them. And uh, so they're gonna have a kind of some sort. And if you look to our thing, there's going to be enums, structs, unions, vars, consts, type defs, and funks. And for these, there's a lot of expression types. So this is a case a beginner trap is to create an expression kind for every single possible um, unique operator rather than factoring out, for example, all binary operators, all unary operators and everything into a, a, the same kind and then using some sub tag to say the specific type because this makes everything much simpler. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to have some sort of broad unary uh, and binary operator categories. We're going to have, for example, something like a function call. Uh, we're going to have int literals. I'm just going to call them ints. Um, names. Maybe these should be up front. They're kind of primitive. Uh, floats. And I'm calling compound. Um, compound literal, compound expression. Um, so what's here? There's going to be casts. And we can actually treat, so this is an example, we can actually treat sort of in terms of the category, we can actually treat stuff like uh, parenthesized expressions as, um, we don't do booleans right now. We just do integer types. Uh, we can do stuff like parenthesized expressions the same way we do unary operators because they both have in common that they have sort of one sub-expression. Um, so stuff like parenthesized uh, expressions will actually can be considered unary in this uh, classification. And, and that will really compress the state of possibilities down quite a bit. Uh, right, so calls, um, I think that's it. And now when we come to here, all oh, right, so there's calls. There's indexing, and there is field access. Then we have a bunch of unaries. Uh, and then we need, uh, I guess I'll call it ternary, just to complete the trifecta. So I may have left something out, but um, this is not a bad list. I think, oh, stir. <clears throat> um, by the way, for all of these general trick, it's always worth having a zero value so that if you do zero initialization and if you get to initialize, you can detect it rather than just thinking it's a legitimate integer or, or enum or whatever. Um, all right, so yeah, so I think that's going to be it for that. And then for statements, we also need kinds. And placeholder. And back to our syntax. So we're going to have a return, definitely an expression statement somewhere down there. Um, and then what I call assign, which is really any of these assignment class operators. 
Um, but there's also, let's call it colon assign. Maybe I should call that something else like auto assign. Yeah, let's call that auto assign. So it's a little more semantic. Oh, the network went down again. Or not, or just my Twitch preview went down. That doesn't matter, all right. Um, all right, so let's see. What were we able to get from our grammar here? Um, return, break, continue, those are probably worth Um, let's call it a block. An if while for do. If while for do. Then these assign auto assign switch. And then these. And we're going to treat increment and decrement as being kinds of assignments so that um, they will just have the, what would normally be a second expression oper operand for the right hand side would just be null for those types. So uh, let's see here. Someone's asking about characters. Characters are not going to be different literals per s or different expression types per se, they're kind of tagged at a different level. Uh, maybe I want to change that later, but I'm trying to stay close to C in that respect. So in C, uh, character literals are just a notation for integers. Uh, the way we're doing it, we tokenize, we represent them as integer tokens, but then we tag the tokens to say, hey, this is actually, this was originally parsed as a character literal, not just any old uh, character, uh, any old integer. And so we can use that information in our C backend to recover a character literal representation rather than just printing it as a decimal int. But uh, but anyway, um, so not to digress too much about that. Um, so, okay, let me just, I think th this looks like a reasonable start. Now let's look at these uh, data structures themselves. Uh, these are going to be, uh, like I said, tagged unions. So I'm going to use, if you guys haven't seen it, I'm going to use a lot of anonymous structs and unions. So um, a union needs what? Um, a union need, needs what? Uh, it needs um, all these have a name, uh, and then enums have a list of items. Each item so f for cases like this, there's not enough commonality actually to factor anything out. So let's just break these out completely. I think that's actually worth worthwhile for this specific case. Um, Normally, I would say that, like for the expressions and statements, it's worth factoring out the commonalities between the different uh, cases. But here, they're so distinct that, uh, and there's not very many of them, so it's worth just kind of breaking it out. So enum decal struct, let's call it aggregate decal. Um, um, bar decal. Decal. Type def decal. Funk decal. And uh, for this, we're going to have um, 
each item is going to be a name and an optional type. So I guess it's, a, it's called a type for now. Um, an optional type. So it can be null. And we're going to use stretchy buffs to just, uh, this is, we may use more traditional AST techniques like just a chaining with linked list pointers, but for now we're just going to use stretchy buffs to make everything really easy, which is another good demo of stretchy buffs. So um, just make a bunch of items actually. So maybe that's just what we do uh, because we don't need anything else. So enum, uh, enum items is one possibility. Um, and what was the, so for a struct, some sort of aggregate, and, and here we have a bunch of fields, right? So, uh, aggregate fields to have a list of names. And then you have a type. Um, you know what? I will visit this later. Let's simplify both the grammar and the um, and the semantics so that we have one name, one type, rather than one comma, you know, x comma y colon int or something like that. Um, so rather than having a name left, name list. Um, no, let's just do it the, the right way. So aggregate fields. Okay, like that. <sighs> this is not really a field. It's called an aggregate item. Because it defines multiple fields. Um, and so having done that, we're back to something fairly reasonable again, where we don't need this wrapper. Um, vars have what? They have um, so vars have a name and an optional type. And actually, we can reuse that for type depths so that these are interpreted, those fields are still there for type depths, but they're interpreted slightly differently, not as a, uh, you know, x colon int, but x equals int as a type depth, but they have the same fields. So uh, we can cannibalize that structure. Um, and then for, and cons are the same, you know, because those also need, we also need a right-hand side expression. So I think that makes sense. That takes const in these, so then we just have functions left. Um, so okay, so function, function decals, let's look at those. So we have the name that we have for everything, and then we have, that probably warrants factoring out. Maybe we'll see. Um, so func param, params, uh, type, return type, uh, ret type, um, each of these is a name and a type. Um, okay, so 
So far so good. Let's just make sure it compiles, even though it's just data definition. Of course it doesn't. Um, so what is a type? A type is really a type spec. Just make sure it makes sense. Okay. So a type spec kind can either be, well, it can be one of a number of things. Um, so it can be a name, it can be, I guess, something, some parenthesized thing, it can be a func, it can be an array, or it can be a pointer. Um, Also be none, which is a sentinel value. Um, do you compile now? Ignore it on. Oh, yeah. Just knowing how this stuff redundant, we, we won't have to do this in ION because this is one of the annoying things about C. Because they have a separate namespace for, uh, I guess they call them tags and types. What's that error? Oh, right, expert. So some of these are recursive, so it probably makes sense to. We also have a nice list up front of this stuff. And then we can remove this. Name, struct member, redefinition. Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, that's a different kind of name. Um, no, it's also not the right one, right? So that, that was actually a straight up mistake the compiler caught for me. That was me, my thinking wrong. Because let's see what the cases are. Var x, you know, var uh, x int equals 42. X is the name, int is the thing, and then this is the right hand side. If I'm doing type dev x equals int, name, x, x is the name, and int is the type spec. So, okay, that seems reasonable. <clears throat> and um, so expression is probably going to be the one that's that's the most bifurcated uh, and complex in terms of the shared structure. So uh, we certainly have things like intval and stirval and floatval um, and name and Let's see. Someone's asking if type depths are going to be strong. Uh, there's going to be a version of type depths that are not strong to match C. In general, except in cases where I think there's like 
hardcore booby traps in C, like the integer promotions and, and uh, arithmetic conversions. Uh, we're mostly going to have equivalents of C where it makes sense. Uh, and we will probably also have just uh, type x equals 42 or something. That will be a hard alias. But if you want to use type def with C's meaning, you can do so. And for now, that's what we're going to support. Um, OK, so boom, cast. So cast is an example, actually, of a unary operator, I guess, is it? Because it takes, no, it takes this type spec as argument. And then, OK, so for casts, um, so I think one thing that's probably useful, no, I can't put out that. Um, so you have sub-expressions. Actually, so let's take one case. If you have a binary operator, then you have these three. Um, if you have a ternary, then you have, uh, you know, cont, uh, then expression, then else expression. Um, and you probably just have like an operand if you're a unary type of operator. Um, but I guess some of those also have a type spec. Um, so this is for unary style operators. This is for unary uh, binary. literals. For something like a field, uh, so what you can say is um, if you are a um, if you are a field, then you need something like a field name uh, or you need an index expression or you need a uh, an argument list if you're a function call. Here we have a, here we're using stretchy buffs as well. Um, call, yeah, let's do it like that. Um, so this covers call, index field, and we have unary, binary, ternary covered, and then we need cast. And we need compound. So compound needs um, let's do compounds up here. Compound literals. Um, Let's see, compound literals um, need, there's an optional type spec, and um, and then let's say compound args. Um, someone's asking, don't you think there ought to be a way that a certain pointer field is actually supposed to always be a stretchy buffer? Um, yeah, there should probably be a convention. Um, for now, though, I'm keeping it as is because the nice thing about it is most of the time, if you're just reading a structure or looking at it, you can just treat it as an array. You're just going to find the size of the array mysteriously absent from the context, so you would have to know. But yeah, maybe, uh, maybe... Actually, that's a good idea. Let me just start doing it, um, and I'm just going to use a comment. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to do anything else. Um, I'll use buff. Um, okay, so. Uh, 
let's see. Okay, let's make sure we caught everything. I don't think we have casts yet. Um, What is it? Per, per has gone rouge or rogue? He said one to two hours per stream. Oh, th th this is just my all-day stream because I want to f uh, f finish the parser as much as possible. We're already get, we're already well on our way. Um, so I'm probably going to go all day, like eight hours or something, until I collapse. <clears throat> yeah, maybe I should just use... Okay, maybe I'll do that. Um, Get out of my build. Um. So this is just going to be an annotation, but it looks a little bit better than a comment, I agree. All right. Why is this thing giving me green underlines? Okay. I need to shut off. I thought I'd turn off all the squiggly lines. I hate, I really hate squiggly lines. Those are one of the most, most obnoxious uh, Visual Studio things. I already disabled squigglies. All right, I'm not gonna look at it now. If anyone knows how to disable this specific uh, green squiggly, let me know in the chat. <clears throat> um, Someone, the person saying they wanted their the buff macro to 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 be used more like uh, this, but the problem I, I don't like this breaks up the natural C idiom of how you declare stuff in in terms of how things go together, or or even this right I don't like that. Uh, if you declare it like this, you just wrap it around a definition. It's just really a way of of I mean it's a no op right. It's tagging an existing definition without changing C in terms of. The, the relative location of the type part and the name part. So uh, I think I'm going to use this for, for now. 
All right, <clears throat> I think this is pretty much it for expressions. Let's just do a final pass to make sure we didn't uh, lose out on any major categories. Um, all right, so boom, 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 it's pretty good. Let's do statements. Um, so some, let's see, some things have uh, a left-hand side and a right-hand side. Uh, we can use this for both post increment where RHS is actually null and, and others. Um, for auto assign, you kind of want like var name, var decal, um, well not var decal, var name, type spec, type spec. Um, and var expression, something like this. And we can use this for both. Yeah, let's just say we don't have a var at this level for now and just have auto assign since this is how that works. Uh, var name, var type. I guess there's no var type, so it's just like this. Um, if block, if you have a see if you have an if then so if expression uh, and I guess you need like a, a clause what do you call that let's call this a statement uh, if clause or if something um, which is a conditional and a body there's going to be a list of those um, And then for if, it's going to be like the then clause. Um, and then this is going to be else if clauses. And else clause. But else, I guess else is just statements, let's say statement, statement block, it's like this. Um, so if clause, you have, let's see, then clause, a bunch of, yeah, so that's still, let's say, no, let's say uh, if expression, let's factor it out a little less. Uh, then block um, else if blocks and then an else block uh, else if clause what do you call it? not an el not a clause a clause is usually something logical else if let's just call it an else if 
um, steps um, get expression then block the, the, um, let's do while Maybe let's factor a lot. A lot of these have let's factor out since a lot of them have a single thing. I don't want to have all these duplicate names. Um, so for our while loop, we need a something like a block. Um, I think we should probably factor this out too, to be honest. Um, here's a bunch of maybe I'll regret this, but I'm just trying to cut down on some of the waste here. Um, var name and then for this yeah so someone's saying I'm using buffs rather than linked lists linked lists are, uh, are actually arguably better for this and we may do it later but because we have these stretchy buffs it's actually far less code to do it this way because we don't have to write all our manual linked list code um, but the linked list approach is actually really good for parsers, uh, but we have this thing, so it's it's the easiest way to bang it out uh, given our current tools. All right, so I'm just thinking of the best factoring for this. Um, so this covers the if then part of if and the while and, and a whole while and also do while um, we don't do switch yet um, switch cases are really just a list of expressions so Maybe a case is going to be a uh, list of expressions uh, and what is logically a statement block, even though This is just the convenience type. Um, and so a switch is going to be, it's going to have an expression and then it's going to have a list of cases. And um, I guess we'll just write it like this. Someone's asking if pointer coherency is going to be a problem when using the buffs. The way we're going to do it is that we build them up before we hand out the pointer to anyone else. So you can imagine a local function that's accumulating, for example, the list of statements in a function. It has a local variable that it's constantly, that, that is the L value for the uh, for the stretchy buff. And so it's going to accumulate into that. And that's, that L value is going to get reassigned when it has to grow. And by the time we actually hook in the pointer to some other uh, AST node, it's already done changing. Um, yeah, so okay. So so basically, it's only mutable during the build process or the build up. It's not mutable after construction. It's not like we're going to do 
tree transformations by adding and deleting things to the stretchy buffs. If we wanted to do that, we would want a linked list structure for those. And we may end up doing that anyway. I just think for now, this is uh, at least error prone currently. And uh, probably the bigger issue is going to be maybe a little bit of performance and memory waste because compared to doing the linked list thing where like you're, out, you're, you're having to grow stuff uh, for often a lot of very small buffers, like very small statement blocks. But uh, this is definitely the easiest way to just bang something out and uh, uh, we don't have to write linked list code too much by hand. All right, so let's see if this makes sense. This is the um, if uh, switch uh, auto assign uh, assignment update. Or yeah, assignment operators. Um, and, and this expression is going to be used for uh, return uh, return if while do uh, switch. Um, it's used for almost everything, so maybe not both. Yeah, so I think that's this is fine. Um, all right, all right, all right. Something like this should be a good starting point. Let's just make a final review here. Don't do four yet. So let's do four. Four needs, uh, it has an expression, and then it has an init, uh, and I'm calling it a block. Um, even though it's not like a curly brace block, it's still logically a block. It's a set of things. Um, and an uh, update block. So it's called for init. Something like this. Or maybe just this. It's unambiguous. <clears throat> Okay, we never finished the type specs. Let's go back and do those. Um, so you could have a name. Um, you could have a index if you're an array type of thing. Uh, and you could have a uh, function declaration which is going to be something like um, didn't I have red type somewhere else Type spec. So there's a ret type, and there's a bunch of, I guess, archetypes. Uh, we'll just say, call that funk. Um, okay, so I think that's it just for the data definition. The next thing we should make are some, um, some convenient ways of making these things. 
because you should you definitely like especially given the fairly complex uh, set of invariants about what fields uh, should be used with certain kinds of expressions and statements and stuff uh, you never want uh, code to, to generate it directly except from a dedicated constructor just because otherwise it's way too error prone so we're going to make those um, so let's see so we need like expression int expression float expression star expression name um What are some expression cast? So cast, uh, let's see, type spec type, and then uh, expression expression, and uh, unary, of course. And we're going to cannibalize a token kind for the op, just so we don't have to redundantly define all those again. Um, but, you know, we could define an enum just for that. Um, oh, and we need... Hmm, maybe we do need that here. Let me just think for a sec. Do we have any... We use a single character for that. Maybe we could just do something like this. So let's use token kind op. <clears throat> and uh Sorry, someone. I think some some dude started drilling in our house. So if it gets too bad, I may have to turn off the sound for a bit. Anyway, unary operator for the given operator symbol. All right. Good night. I'm just gonna keep banging along. Uh, all right, so what should we do next? I guess we have to do the compound literals. Once we've done the expressions, I will do the S expression dumper for, um, sorry, just reset myself. I will do the, uh, the S expression dumper for expressions before we do the statements and declarations. It'll be the hardest part anyway, but uh, I just want to get sort of an end-to-end -end construction and dumping flow uh, for that. And, uh, and so the way this is going to look is we'll do something like this. Uh, I guess kind, then we'll do size of expression, uh, or sorry, actually, so let me do it slightly differently. So let's do it this way, uh, expression alloc, um, kind, which is the basic field. Uh, 
and I'm actually going to calloc this because I don't want to. Um, sorry about the noise, guys. If it becomes really unbearable, I'll turn it down. Um, yeah, I want to make sure I catch bugs where I forget to initialize some fields and stuff like that. I guess I should use xcalloc. Which I'll have to implement. Um, Okay, um, so do the x calloc and set the kind and return. Um, something like that. Um, so, so let's write some expression tests. Um, and let's write some AST tests that for now just call this one. Um, someone's asking, will there be any code gen? No, code gen is way premature, dude. That's a week away to do proper code gen. Uh, the hard part is not code gen so much as it's uh, all the semantic checking and uh, handling out of order declarations and stuff. This will be, so So we basically did a, a, almost a full lecture on the sort of official stream. Uh, now I designed the grammar with, without much prep. So that the first part was just kind of designing the, most of the grammar. And now we built out the AST to reflect that grammar. Uh, now I'm, you know, built, finishing up the AST stuff, and then we will be writing a AST to S expression dumper, so we can easily debug stuff. So we can print our AS, ASTs to text and look at them in a file and and make sense of them. And then finally, we're going to do the parser. And uh, surprisingly, the parser will be probably less work than a lot of what we're doing now. But this is the necessary groundwork to get there. <clears throat> All right, um, and so I guess let's just uh, validate that uh, we have the right for now. I mean, this is pretty, I, I can look at the code and see that it does that, but um, just in case I break it later, might not be the worst idea in the world. Um, All right, so we're just gonna repeat the exercise for these other cases. I call it new. It's not necessary here. It's not 
just doing this by hand to make sure I didn't screw it. Okay. Um, Um, so for cast, we have what's it cast? Um, what do you call it? Uh, cast type, I guess. What's the cast expression? It's pretty self-explanatory, but we can't. So this is where maybe. Be a little bit confusing with those names. Sorry, just got a message. Um, all right, let's see, where were we? Um, unary, get an op. Uh, set the op, set the expression. I don't remember what we called it. I guess just left. Oh, operand. That's what we called it. Go ahead and added it. I'm not going to do a lot of testing on it. I'd rather just print it. Um, because if we print it, we can eyeball it. And it's a lot easier to do that than to write complicated structural tests uh, in you know, units, code driven unit style uh, of testing. So let's do the, the dumper now. I think that covers all the types.
we want to do proper quoting, let's not do quoting for now. Um, because we have to do escapes when we print out, but uh, let's not do escapes and just be lazy for now just to get going and then we'll we'll fix that. Um, Type uh, print type spec. So this is cast type. I guess I'll just call it print type for now. Um, and uh, once we're done with that, we will print expression type.
probably we don't need this actually. We have to treat this as a parse only thing. We need this for some other things, but not for the types, I guess. Is it called? Args. Yeah, that's what it's called. Rip. Fuck types back. Okay. Fuck types back. It up there. Why the implementation of how it was hosed here? Typical Visual Studio crap. <clears throat> So if you have an array, you have a um, a type um, expression. Type spec um, an array of
base type, and then uh, I guess you say length or size. Just base the size, I think it's fine. So base type size. Need to do the same deal here, except it's a bit simpler. Pointer types. Let's call these R, make them nice and short. Chances are this is not going to work at all, but um, we can try here. So we can start with this very simple example. Okay, so far so good. Get 42. And then the question is, if we do something more complex, like um, binary plus int 1 int Two. What will happen? Okay, that already didn't work. Oh, I didn't implement these, so no, no, no surprise really. Um, but what happened now? Let's just look. Yeah, that's not right. A typo somewhere. Oh, I can't move. Bad. Bad person. Didn't work. Let's see why not. Okay, it's just because we didn't do anything yet. All right. Um, so I think we need, for now, we can just use the op directly as a character. Um, Do the same for this. We'll stuff this in just so we at least know we're handling it, even if we're not really printing sub expressions correctly. It still doesn't work. We should also do this. Um, not that we're needing to handle that, but let's complete it. Um, let's say ternary. Um, could also write if style. Yeah, let's write ternary. Um, See what happens here. Actually, we can look a little bit at expression. So expression is a binary operator. Um, this looks like an, and the ASCII range is probably the right one. Then you want to look at the left field 
which has an int as value one, uh, right field. Okay, so that looks correct. Um, okay, that does work. I don't know why that didn't show up on the screen. Okay. Let's do some more complicated stuff. Um, Um, actually, we could do it even better. We could just say Okay, so let's do some other stuff. Um, so we could do binary minus 42 or uh, 3.5, let's say. Okay, that works. Um, so let's do ternary. Beth. Um, the first part is a name x, uh, or if flag, and then let's say just um, true or false. I'm going to call this if, just like Lisp, just because it's going to be more readable. Just have to know it's not an if statement. Suppose we have a field of uh, person. Uh, the field is called the name. Expression field. Um, I guess I didn't create all of those cases here. So we call one of them is the operand, and then you have the arcs. It's going to be 
the call. So we index. So find my something for fields. Let's do a call to a function. So we're calling a function called factorial. And we want to call it with the integer 42. Oh. Maybe I should just assume they're stretchy buffs. Mm, that shouldn't leak too much into the API. But let me just do that that way for now. Um, Yeah, that should. Something I should reconsider, I guess, about using the stretchy buffs in a way that leaks into the API. That's definitely, I think, not a good idea. Um, okay, that did work at least. Um, best way to do that. Okay, let's just eventually we'll construct them by parsing so we don't have to do too many by hand. Just want to do a couple. Uh, index, let's say we index an array or actually let's combine some stuff. Say we take the address of um, base and then Say field. Um, say person. Um, uh, siblings. And then three. All right. Fields, they're not expressions, they're just no, definitely not <laughs> definitely not constants or uh, char literals. So third index of person dot siblings is correct. Um What else should we test? I guess we should do casts. 
So cast. Um, let's yeah, we don't have any other types occurring, so this is a good test for that. Cast from um, say point pointer. I'm doing too much Python. I'm getting used to single quotes for strings. That's not a good habit. Um, cast from a variable which contains a point pointer to a type. Um, I guess we should have, we have to make type constructors for for these guys as well. Um, so type spec type. Okay, let's just cast to, to some named thing for now. Let's see if that works. And then we'll make it a compound type. Cast, yep, so that works. So instead, let's say it's actually a pointer to an int. Um, okay, is this a good point to take a break? It probably is. Um, this is not exhaustive by any means, but uh, and there's entire areas I haven't exercised, but it seems like the basic stuff works. The thing that gives me pause, even though it's convenient for the sort of privileged path, which is the way I intend to write the parser to um, use stretchy buffs, by making them part of the API, it's kind of, I mean, you can kind of see how funky it is because you can't just pass a normal C array with the size of, it wants a magic pointer that, that happens to point to a buffer uh, that's preceded by a stretchy buff header. So I'll have to think about whether that's actually the right call, just from a kind of, I guess you could say, API design perspective. Like, regardless of what we use to accumulate those arrays, they should probably just have explicit lengths rather than what I was doing here. Um, so like, I'm going to change this. I can still accumulate them with stretchy buffs if that's my if that's my thing. 
be careful here. So you see, I'm just going to factor that out. Actually, let's just call this enums. Um, let's be consistent. Um, let's see. And you know what? I'm happy I tagged them with buff when I wrote them because now I can find them. So that already paid off. Yeah, it's just yeah. I feel better about this already. This is just much much cleaner. Much improved. Where, where were we? Expression test. Let's clean that up. And so now we can do, we can actually use C++ 99 tracks. Yay. So we can do, um, Say so one argument. Yes. Is it something like this? Uh, let's first fix up the call function. Differs in level of interaction. Um, so we need expression pointers. Can I do this? Um, oh, I guess I can. Let's try that. Yeah, that didn't work. Yeah, so. Well, I've got the 42. Um, 
let's find that one then step in here so far so good num args okay num args didn't get initialized that's why because I didn't put it, it's probably in a union somewhere. Yep. So, you know, you've been doing this programming shit for too long when you immediately spot that stuff. Okay, so now we're back to having stuff that works. Um, and now I think it's time for lunch break. But let me just read questions first. Uh, I thought it was a, it's a pretty good headway. Someone's asking, do I plan on freeing any of the memory you allocate in this compiler? Um, I mean, yes and no. Right now we're just calling the system allocator for every individual allocation. Um, probably tomorrow I will show how to do a simple 20 line arena allocator that will essentially do everything out of, uh, you know, basically we, we ask for like 10 megabyte blocks or whatever the granularity is from the OS at a time, do everything out of that. And when we run out, we ask for another one. And when we do that, we're essentially just going to do all the allocations during a compilation out of these linear arenas. And then when we're done with the compilation, um, we can, you know, we can, we can just free all like we can free a couple of those large multi megabyte blocks so that's how it's going to be right now it's very easy right now to do that because everything is encapsulated under stuff like alloc so there's not a lot of uh, individual calls to uh, to system malloc so we will replace this by like arena alloc um, you know temp alloc uh, or temp temp arena or something like that but for now we're just uh, going to use the system allocator because uh, to not do so would be a distraction, and at this point would yield no gains. Um, all right. So who else is saying stuff? Um, dun, 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 dun. I see some people who found bugs that I think I found myself as well. Um, all right, so I'll stick around for one more minute and then I'll cut the stream. I uh, may actually continue streaming after lunch, but more likely I will take a break and then I'll just do some slower paced coding where I'm not trying to just go at max speed because uh, I think we probably wrote a thousand lines of code at least, right? So that was a little bit hectic. Yep, I think we wrote about a thousand lines between the grammar and everything. So I'm, I'm pretty pretty tired and need a break. And we'll probably just take it slow for the rest of the day and do some code review and clean up. So uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I didn't talk so much, um, but you can kind of see we can go pretty fast uh, when, when I'm not trying to explain every little detail. So, but hopefully some people still found this fun. And I know that it's Sunday in the U.S., so um, if you don't have anything better to do, I guess listening to me or watching me type on my keyboard uh, could be a, a good way to spend time. But anyway, thanks for, uh, for hanging out. I will go get my lunch now. I'm famished, but this was a lot of fun. And um, we didn't actually get to parsing, but uh, we, we got pretty far. And I will, I think what, I, what I'll do the rest of the day is I'll do the rest of the AST. And then tomorrow we can do actual parsing on the official stream, and I think that will probably be a good, um, a good sort of sync point in any case. So anyway, I'm off for now, and uh, thanks for hanging out.